Congratulations. You're officially inducted. This is your first meeting as an acting town manager. And this is my first meeting as the acting town manager. I, I forgot. Yes. Congratulations. Trial by fire. Yes. Welcome, everybody. Taser. Uh, Taser. This is the uh, Wednesday, April 25th, 2018, special town council meeting, uh, a public hearing uh, on a series of recall petitions. Uh, we had uh, worked with the fire department uh, this week to be able to increase the capacity from 130 to 160. Uh, it meant that some of the chairs had to disappear from the room, uh, but there was a very continuous demand for uh, that level of capacity. It's nice to see that uh, we're below it, and we were able to uh, have the staff bring some, uh, uh, some chairs back in. Uh, it, uh, hopefully people won't be uncomfortable. Jim Butler is the uh, fire department's uh, specialist uh, and is here to, uh, which has also allowed us to increase our capacity. Uh, so with that, let's call the meeting to order and rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Uh, roll call, please. Councilor Baybine? Present. Councilor Rowan? Here. Councilor Foley? Here. Councilor Katarina? Here. Councilor Hayes? Here. Chairman Dunamis? Here. Uh, new business. Order 18-33, 6 p.m. public hearing on the recall petition of Donna Bealey, Board of Education, pursuant to Chapter 201, the Town Charter, Section 9036 and 9061. Uh, let me uh, uh, make some remarks so that people will sort of get a good sense of how the meeting will be run. Uh, uh, this hearing uh, is a result of uh, uh, recall petitions uh, that were, bought, were brought under the Town of Scarborough uh, Town Charter. Uh, it allows uh, for uh, a 25 percent uh, uh, signature uh, on petitions, uh, and those three petitions were submitted for Donna Bealey, Carrie Lyford, and Jody Shea. The town clerk confirmed the necessary signatures for the th three petitions on April 6th, and at the 11, April 11 town council meeting, the town council accepted the certification and set today, April 25th, for the three public hearings. The requirement to hold a public hearing appears at section 9061 of the town charter. Uh, it reads, quote, upon receipt of the verification of sufficiency and validity from the clerk under section 9053, the town council shall call a public hearing to be held within 30 days of the date of the clerk's certification. We comply with that requirement today. Uh, the town council's role in this. The Town Council's role is to conduct the hearings, not judge the merits of the petitions or render a judgment from the public hearing itself. Our role is to fairly run the public hearing. There will be no Town Council deliberation once the three Board of Education members conclude their remarks uh, at the end of the hearing. The audience for all remarks are really the citizens of Scarborough and those sought to be recused. We have turned the podium so that everyone's remarks are directed at the three board, board members and the, and the audience, uh, as opposed to directing it at the town council, which in this case, our job is just to run a good meeting, a fair meeting. Uh, the purpose of the public hearing is recited in section 9036, uh, and I quote, at the public hearing required by section 9061, the official sought to be recalled shall have the right to be heard, and the town council should give the official a reasonable opportunity to respond to the reasons stated in the recall petition and to public comment. I interpret the reference in the charter to public comment as allowing members of the public to speak today. Uh, I would, however, point out that as you can see from the charter provision itself, uh, the three hearings tonight are primarily intended for the person sought to be recalled to defend themselves. The three uh, petitions 
all read the same for the three Board of Education uh, members. Uh, quote, each of the undersigned voters respectfully requests the recall of Donna Beely, second petition, Gary Lightford, third petition, Jody Shea, who is an elected official who currently serves on the Board of Education due to incompetence. The process we'll follow tonight uh, is that we are going to have three separate hearings. As a means of uh, arbitrarily selecting which hearing goes first, I simply have gone in alphabetical order. Uh, therefore, uh, Mrs. Beely will go first, Mrs. Lyford will go second, and Mrs. Shea will go third. Uh, we will take a five-minute break between the hearings. The room is warm, uh, and I think people will want to have an opportunity, especially those who are uh, standing uh, for the uh, uh, duration, to, uh, to step outside. Uh, the three hearings will also be conducted in an identical manner. Uh, in each hearing, the uh, board member will be given the opportunity to speak first, as well as anyone uh, else uh, that they mis may wish to uh, ask, assist them in speaking uh, uh, to the room. Co public comment will follow. Thereafter, the board member may, may make closing remarks if they choose to. The public comment rules. Public comment shall be as it is traditionally done at the uh, town council. Each speaker shall recite their name and address and shall have three minutes. In fairness to everyone, I will ask speakers to strictly abide by the three-minute limit. I do not want to be judging the merits of one speaker's remarks over another, whether to allow them to continue or ask them to conclude. Uh, remarks should be directed exclusively at the reason cited for recall, which is uh, incompetence as to each individual. I do not want to interrupt anyone when speaking uh, uh, to give them the courtesy of the chance to speak. Uh, uh, so please make it quite evident that you are addressing the issue of incompetence for the individual who's hearing uh, we're, uh, uh, we're attending at any given moment. Uh, I will attempt to balance speakers so both points of view are heard. It's not going to necessitate a rush to the podium line. We will try to have people uh, line up along the wall back there so that there's some order to it. Uh, I would like to be able to have uh, speakers from both points of view, whether you're for uh, the petition or you're against the petition, just in fairness. Uh, the exception to that is that the petition has been brought by uh, an organization called Road to Renewal. They have informed uh, Larissa Crockett, the assistant town manager today, that they have uh, about a 15-minute uh, presentation. Uh, and uh, uh, in deference to uh, the, they being the petitioner, uh, we'll allow that to be a uh, continuous uh, speaker arrangement. Uh, I do realize that, that people's comments may be directed at all three members. Uh, much of the commentary that we've seen on uh, 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 social media and the newspapers has not tried really to specifically differentiate between one school board member from another. While the hearings are separate, I don't want to force people to be coming up repeatedly. Public speaking is hard enough as it is. so. Uh, Take the opportunity to simply say, my remarks are intended to be directed at all three board uh, members, whether it's uh, for or against. Uh, we'll record those as being uh, applicable and a part of the record for all three hearings. That way we can achieve a degree of efficiency uh, uh, in the hearing today. If speakers have addressed your point, points of emphasis, uh, you don't have to get up and speak. You can, you can go up and simply say, the remarks that were made by so-and-so reflect my attitude, my viewpoint, and that would certainly be uh, sufficient. We do not expect people to, and I really would encourage you to not 
be repetitious or redundant so that we're listening to the same nature of remarks uh, time and again. Uh, it will also be helpful if everyone can be as succinct as possible. We may have many people who wish to speak. Uh, uh, it's not my intention to set a strict time limit for the hearing because with the rules that we're trying to set up, we're trying to allow people to make their remarks and make them once. Uh, therefore, the first hearing may go longer than, uh, than the second or the third, because uh, I expect most people are going to be pretty sensible about it and say, I've said my piece, uh, and so I'm fine with it. Uh, however, I do plan uh, to be about as efficient as we possibly can uh, so that uh, we get through this difficult process as quickly as possible. Uh, I am mindful of the capacity problems of this meeting place. Uh, we have experienced difficulty with other locations, not providing us with the te television or audio quality that we needed. Uh, this hall is also the council chambers and is an appropriate setting for a matter of this seriousness. Uh, to be able to have everyone appreciate the uh, uh, seriousness of this, I think it was important to hold the meeting here. I'm glad that those who did wish to attend have all been able to get in. Uh, we have invited anyone who was not able to attend today uh, to submit a written statement, and uh, uh, Assistant Town Manager Larissa Crockett has collected those, and we will read those in the order uh, in which the hearings go forward. Uh, Mr. Donovan, order. Yes. When will you take public comment about the date of the recall? We will be taking public comment about the date uh, on order 18-36, which follows immediately after the third of these public hearings. Uh, the rules of decorum. <clears throat> uh, it goes without saying that this is a serious matter, uh, and it deserves great respect. Uh, accordingly, the town council's rules of decorum will be strictly enforced. Uh, they appear in Chapter 302 of the town's rules. Uh, they are posted uh, on the board to my right, uh, and I will read them so that those who are too far away will uh, understand them. Persons will strive to be accurate in their statements and avoid making personal, rude, or provocative remarks. Uh, uh, persons present at council meetings, including elected officials, are requested not to applaud or otherwise express approval or disapproval of any statements made or action taken at such meeting. Uh, all statements made by speakers shall respect the dignity and seriousness of the proceeding. Persons shall conduct themselves in a manner expected of all meeting participants. It shall be at the discretion of the council chair to ask any persons making inappropriate statements and or conducting themselves in a disrespectful manner to cease such action or risk being asked to be seated or removed. Uh, so I want to emphasize, given the seriousness of this particular proceeding, that I do intend to uh, uh, have these rules strictly enforced. Point of order. Uh, yes. The case that you uh, initiated against me in November for a criminal trespass was dismissed with prejudice. You, Nadine, and the council itself is going to be sued along with the town of Scarborough. I filed a notice of claim against you. Content-based censorship is against the First Amendment. The case was dismissed by the judge with prejudice because I cited a number of United States Supreme Court rulings where you personally cannot order people under the First Amendment to uh, curtail comments, whether they're personal, derogatory, or rude, in a public forum. So if you enforce that, I will initiate another claim against you. Thank you. Uh, and it, it, it is our position that these are not uh, unconstitutional content-based uh, rules. Uh, we will uh, 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 
begin the hearing uh, with, uh, and I will recognize Donna Beely, Chair of the Scarborough Town Council. School board. Thank you. School board. <laughs> yes, you want to speak? <laughs> Good evening and thank you for coming this evening. Before I make my statement this evening, I want to introduce you to uh, a gentleman who is here, Mr. Stephen Bailey. Steve is the executive director of the Maine School Board Association and he is going to say a few words to you this evening regarding school board responsibilities. Will you come up please, Steve? Good evening, and yes, my name is Stephen Bailey, and I am the Executive Director of the Maine School Boards Association, as well as the Maine School Management Association. And in that role, as Director of the MSBA, we serve the Maine School Boards of the state. We serve and represent school boards comprising the association. We promote and maintain local control of public schools, we promote closer cooperation among the individual school boards. We represent the combined interest of school boards in the legislative process. We also cooperate with other agencies in the state interested in the improvement of public education. And through the school boards provide information for them and the general public about the needs and the accomplishments of our public schools. We sponsor, develop, and encourage these projects and programs that promote better public education in Maine. As part of the work that MSBA does, we hold school board development and board training workshops. And I have been here in Scarborough to conduct such workshops. We also provide member resources through phone calls, emails, and visits, and these have to do with policy updates and revisions, statutes uh, that are in, in affected in the law, as well as legislation advocacy, and also help with negotiations and collective bargaining agreements prior to any involvement that they may need with uh, school attorneys. For school board members, this is in, an important aspect of the work we do, and also work that we recognize in terms of the important roles that school board members play within, within each of the school units within the state. School board members are elected by the town and they are provided authority for actions through the laws of the state. They're guided by this Maine Education and School Statute book and they're dealing with subsection 101-1001 which is the section that deals with school boards. They become part of a board when they're elected as an individual member. However, from several cases within the Maine Supreme Court and writings from Drummond Woodsum, Maine school boards are unique. The school committee acts as a public board. However, in no sense represents the town. Its members are chosen by the voters of the town, but after the election, they are public officers deriving their authority from the law and responsible to the state for the good faith and rectitude of their acts. And rectitude means morally correct behavior or thinking. This was in the Shaw versus Small case that was decided back in 1924 and has held since. In terms of board powers and duties, there are several that are identified within the main statutes. The first is to adopt policy. The second is to select a superintendent. The third is to provide resources and facilities for the schools and staff and students through the budget. For Scarborough, their duties and powers are guided by policy BBA, which you all can have access to because it is on their website. And I'll read it to you. Board of Education powers and duties. The powers and duties of the Board of Education will be conferred and prescribed by law. The board will be responsible for the management of the schools, will adopt and direct the general course of study, and will provide programs in kindergarten through grade 12. 
In the interpretation of the powers and duties of the board, it is understood that the board will act as a governing body in the determination of general policies for the control, operation, maintenance, and expansion of the public schools. The Board of Education will delegate administrative matters to the superintendent. The superintendent, as it relates to policy and Scarborough, the superintendent will select staff. Now, with regard to that, and this is by statute, the superintendent must nominate, the board provides approval, and the superintendent hires. And typically this is for administrative positions as well as for teaching positions. The superintendent will recommend and implement policy and propose and administer the budget and act based on policy. Members only have board authority when participating in actions of the board when participating in an officially called meeting. They're only board members when they're together in an officially called meeting and that's when they have authority to act as a board. Board of Education member authority can be referenced in their policy BBAA and I'll read that to you as well. Members of the Board of Education have authority only when acting as a board. The board will not be bound in any way by any action or statement on the part of any board member except when such statement or action is in pursuance of specific instructions from the Board of Education. And secondly, no board member by virtue of his or her office will exercise any administrative responsibility with respect to the schools or as an individual command the services of any school employee. And again, I would just say only the members of the board only have board authority when a quorum is present. And this is seen also in the Scarborough Charter, section 404, where I quote, every vote of the Scarborough School Board shall require the affirmative vote of at least four members. Mm -hmm. So this is information that I was asked and very eager to share with you this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. I, I know you have a long ride home this evening, so leave when you feel you, you need to uh, due to the rainstorm outside. So I am Donna Bealey, and I have been on the school board for the past five and a half years. I'm currently the chair of the board, and I was the chair from 2014 to 2016. What makes me competent to be a school board member? What have I done that would demonstrate that confidence? First, let me tell you about my own career in K-12 education, since that serves to provide you the foundation on which my knowledge and competence as a school board member has been built. I spent 38 years working in K-12 schools. I worked in three New England states in seven school systems, in three of those have been in Maine public schools. I've worked at all grade levels K-12. I've been a teacher, a guidance counselor, an assistant principal, and a principal. I also worked for two years at USM in the ETEP program. That's a teacher preparation program. I made observations, evaluations, and recommendations for potential teacher candidates for both graduation and employment. Nearly six years ago, while volunteering at Project Grace, a school board member at the time asked me to run for the school board. I had recently retired from education, and it made sense to me to utilize my real work experiences and apply that to the Scarborough School District of my hometown. Education has been my life's work, and this would allow me to continue the mission I have always followed to improve education for children. Excuse me for a minute. 
For, ne for nearly 60 years, I believe I have demonstrated my competence in this field again and again, as evidenced by my work on the board during regular twice monthly meetings, but more importantly, in the many hours of work done in committees or at home, interacting with the community by phone, online, and in person. In spite of budget disappointments, I have found my work on the school board to be an enjoyable experience. In order to make decisions on the board, I've relied on my knowledge of the legal requirements under K-12 state and federal laws in education and the impact on students and teachers. I had been employed during the No Child Left Behind Act, and I already knew about Every Student Succeeds Act. I was familiar with Maine's learning results and how much time it took for teachers to match the course content with the standards. I know what it takes to be a teacher today. With all the requirements of the laws and mandates and the importance of providing individualized learning plans for students, understanding child development, medical and behavioral issues, and parents' dreams and hopes for their children. I also believed that by serving on the school board, I could support our teachers as well as our students and my community. I have an, and continue to enjoy my work on the school board. And I especially enjoy serving alongside the other professionals who make up the board membership. I have been a member of the policy committee, the communications committee, the outreach reach committee to the two vocational schools, Portland and Westbrook. I was liaison to the teacher professional development and evaluation team, the school and business partnership committee. And currently, I, along with being the chair, am serving on the negotiations committee for three school bargaining units. Here are just a few of the things that I, along with other board members, have worked to accomplish during the past six years that I consider critical for the education of our students and that demonstrate competence. With the help of the IT director, Jen Day, the board managed to finally get one-to-one -one computers for our students and our staff. Having worked elsewhere in this state, I knew for a fact that many other towns around us had those computers, and we did not. So I was really proud of the work of the board to get those after several years. In an effort to increase budget transparency, I participated in joint town department forums at the high school to answer every question possible asked by any citizen in this town. This had included speaking in numerous town settings, going around town to retirement communities, service club organizations, and just in the last two weeks, to the Hillcrest community and to the Wentworth School on a Saturday afternoon morning to answer questions from anyone who decided to come to the meeting. As chair, I led the process for the school board regarding a national search for a superintendent and that work took eight months. I, along with board members, returned seventh grade sports to the budget after it was lost in budget cuts. I supported and fought for the professional development time needed by the high school teachers in order to do the work of the NEASC school accreditation process. This was a difficult fight, and it was very, very important work teachers needed the time for, and I fought for it. I personally supported and advocated for the school backpack program, providing food for students during school vacations and weekends. I encouraged and was involved in the school business partnership, seeking to increase opportunities in our community for high school students to have internships in area businesses, increasing their knowledge of the workplace environment. I supported and applauded 
the work of our K2 principals to have a summer program to reach out to entering kindergartners, students who needed to increase their preparation for kindergarten. I spoke on several occasions about the need to look at whether the district needed to offer a preschool program knowing full well that there are children in our town whose parents could not afford private pay programs. I attended, along with other board members, statewide conferences for school board members to expand and understand the legal obligations of school board members. Additionally, I participated in webinars and I attended workshops for educators so that I could keep current with what the current K-12 initiatives were. For the past four years, I attended the meetings our district had with Harriman Associates to understand the conditions of our facilities, the enrollment projections, and the anticipated housing starts and the effect that this may have on the need for new buildings or school renovations and the possible impact on taxpayers. I believe I have done my job to demonstrate my competence. I made decisions based on not just listening to people, but on researching topics, seeking knowledge from other school districts, from other policies elsewhere around the state, from other experts, from other school board members in other towns trying to gather all the information I needed to satisfy my decision making. While not always popular, I stand by those decisions. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Bailey. Uh, public comment. Uh, if you would uh, uh, try to line up along the uh, corridor there, uh, and uh, <coughs> don't, be a, don't be afraid. Somebody has to go first. I will go first. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. My name is Jackie Perry. I live at 215 Black Point Road. I am a member of the school board. Webster says incompetent, lacking the qualities needed for effective action, or not legally qualified, or inadequate <clears throat> to or unsuitable for a particular purpose. Clearly, the voters of Scarborough saw these women as competent when they were elected and just because there are voters who now disagree with their actions, which, by the way, are totally committed to benefiting our students, they are being recalled. If you read the media, you will have read that the reason for the recall is to place people in office who will fire the superintendent and rehire the high school principal. Not a legal or moral reason for this action. The high school principal resigned, perhaps a knee-jerk reaction, perhaps in a fit of anger, but he resigned. And once he took that action, he forfeited his right to a hearing before the board. Keep this in mind. I am termed out. Mary Starr has served almost two years. Two members were elected in November. None of them has ever done a superintendent search a long process when done right at a cost to ten to fifteen thousand dollars. Let us say the recall is successful, three new members, superintendent fired, her contract is more than a hundred and thousand a hundred thousand dollars per year, so you buy her out? Will she go for the cost of the contract? Does she have the grounds to sue? Let us say the superintendent has appointed a new principal. Cost to buy up that contract. 
We are now at over $210,000 added to the budget. Then a new superintendent and a high school principal must be hired because some of the people don't like the answers to their questions and or they disagree with school board decisions. How is that justifiable for recall? And will it help pass a budget? There are already many people who say they did not know what they were signing when they were presented the petitions. My neighbor was asked, do you want to improve our town? The signs here held by folks said, bring back Mr. Creech. But the ballot will ask that we recall three school board members. I'm glad that all of the viral emails have not been made public. This town would be ashamed. The letter referred to in the news is horrible. I received a copy. Our town is better than this. These women are not to blame for what is going on. Our principal came here when we needed someone with charisma who would be the face of our high school, and he did that well. But there is more to having charisma when it comes to leading the academic side of our schools. I find it difficult to believe that this has all come out of the blue. And keep in mind that I have served with the previous superintendent and have been privy to information that continues to be confidential. Also remember this, it is the superintendent's job to what is, do what is best for our students and for our town. She believes that she is doing that and so do I. So do these board members. These board members do not need to be recalled. And lastly, who will want to come to our town to be a superintendent or a high school principal? Thank you. Good evening, everybody. My name is Paul Johnson. I reside at 78 Mitchell Hill Road. Uh, I am one of the leadership of Road to Renewal. Uh, before I get started, I'd like to thank Toddy Justice for, uh, excuse me, Toddy Justice for all her help. The uh, amount of professionalism has been incredible, so we just thank her for that. She's a calm eye in this storm. I had a phone call on Monday night from a gentleman from the town that I've never met, and he wanted to ask me, how do we quantify incompetence? And at first, I didn't have a, a great answer for him because I never met him before. So, but I thank him now because I did go home and I thought about, you know, what, how do I quantify incompetence? And I guess my number I'm coming up with is 185. 185 teachers have voted no confidence in this town of the Board of Education and the current superintendent. That means if you right now are sitting in this room with a high school student, 99% of the adults that teach your high school student have no confidence in the superintendent and the Board of Education. If your child is not in the high school, at least half of the adults that your child comes in contact every day, every week, and for the rest of this school year have no confidence in the Board of Education and the superintendent. Interestingly, there has not been a single acknowledgement of this no confidence from the Board of Education or their superintendent. There hasn't been one moment of self-reflection. There hasn't been one moment of what could I do better. That's how I measure incompetence. The gentleman from the, from the state of Maine stood up and said that the Board of Education had three objectives that overrode everything. And the second one was to hire an effective superintendent. With all due respect, our superintendent is ineffective and incompetent. This is hard, but this is not the time to circle the wagons and defend ineffective leadership. 
This is the time to end the ineffective leadership as fast as humanly possible. Or our kids are going to continue to have contact with adults day in and day out that do not have confidence in the leadership of this town. Good evening, David Cleary, 33 Meeting House Road. The next several speakers will make a statement with respect to Mrs. Bealey. Effective leaders help a community succeed. As school board chair, Donna Bealey has failed to lead our community in a positive direction. Instead, she has been our school district's steward during this most controversial and divisive time. It is her lack of coll collaboration, communication, accountability, and transparency that brings us here today. Scarborough School Board's educational mission and philosophy states, quote, in order to achieve our goals and to implement this philosophy, we believe that all schools must secure the involvement of the community, students, staff, parents, and citizens. Educational responsibility must be shared with important community institutions. We strongly believe that our school system's success depends on good rapport and cooperation with our communities and its institutions, end quote. If these clearly defined values are at the forefront of our school board's mission and philosophy, why are we here today? Under Mrs. Bealey's guidance as chairperson, our board refused to listen to the legitimate concerns of Scarborough's students, teachers, and parents related to both late start and proficiency-based education and diplomas. Mrs. Bealey has also failed to address the concerns raised by our community and supported the superintendent as she plowed forward without a viable implementation plan, all to the detriment of our students. The late start implementation failure was a direct result of Mrs. Bealey's mentality of figuring it out as we go along. No one disputes the science supporting a later start time for adolescents, but when a community does not have the resources for such a drastic implementation model without negatively impacting numerous stakeholders, it's time to pause. In a story reported by GME on January 12th, the reporter wrote, quote, Bealey said at this point the new start times are a done deal, end quote. Jody Shea even acknowledged in the second reading of this late start compromise that our community had a transportation problem. She finally acknowledged that and even agreed with our community's major concerns, but it only happened after the recall had started. The reality is, if there wasn't a recall, the compromise never would have happened and our community's input would have been ignored. As the board chair, Mrs. Bealey has specific re responsibilities and expectations to ensure effective governance of her school board. In fact, the main school board handbook states that school board chairs should keep in mind that both the ch board chair and the superintendent should have the opportunity for independent thinking and to bring an individual perspective to school problems or concerns. Avoid snap decisions and judgments, including those relative to the performance of the superintendent and other administrative personnel. Get the facts first. Serve as the guardian of fairness and even-handed discussion for other members of the board. And finally, show restraint when dealing with the public on behalf of the board. Thank you. Good evening, Amy Glidden, 104 Ash Swamp Road. Donna Bealey has failed in the responsibilities and expectations of board chair in a variety of ways, but the most egregious display of these absent characteristics is in her failed leadership related to Principal Creech's forced resignation. No one argues that the superintendent has the task of hiring and terminating employees. But what is the Board of Education's responsibility in a situation when the superintendent they have supervisory responsibility over makes a terrible and impulsive decision? Jackie Perry has admitted that Donna Bailey knew ahead of time that Principal Creech was going to be forced to resign. She failed to inform and discuss this decision with our collective board. In fact, a community member broke the news of Principal Creech's forced resignation to at least one BOE member. How many other board members found out via the community before the superintendent sent her email notification? As chair, Donna Bealey should have shared this information with the board. She failed to recognize that forcing the resignation of a competent, respected, and productive principal like Dave, David Creech would not sit very well with the Scarborough community. 
Rather than investigate and get the facts straight, she dug her heels in and hid behind the personnel issue argument. The truth is there was no personnel issue. Principal Creech has demonstrated exemplary leadership at the high school. He has no disciplinary record, he has never been on an action plan, and he got a 2% performance-based raise at the beginning of this year. This was his sixth year in the district. Our human resources are the most important commodity in education, yet Mrs. Bealey condoned the disrespectful and thoughtless manner in which one of our best human resources was told to leave the district. Why would a veteran principal with this level of impact be told to resign 15 days before the required March 1st deadline? for non-renewal and only be given 48 hours to make his choice. Why didn't Superintendent Kuchenberger give Principal Creech until close to March 1st so that he could be thoughtful in his decision and not have to make it under duress before a weekend when he had to work all day for the MPA at the basketball tournament? The FOA provides documentation corroborating that Superintendent Kuchenberger asked for Principal Creech's resignation because he supported his staff and allowed them to ask the top decisions related to the BOE and the superintendent's policy initiatives. He allowed them to have a voice in the decision-making process. He was actually doing what Maine law requires and what our very own school board policy endorses. This Maine school board handbook guides that obtaining input from teachers on educational policy issues is not only the law, it makes good sense. The board should take time to obtain feedback on proposed policies from other affected groups as well Policies that are hastily made or made in the midst of a crisis are rarely effective. RBOE failed to heed the MSBA's guidance. The remarks need to be related to the incompetence of the board member. And so uh, I would ask the speakers to relate all references to any action that uh, uh, may be referred to to the incompetence of uh, Mrs. Bealey. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Raquel Unlin at 19 Evergreen Farms Road. The Scarborough Board of Education has the following to say about staff involvement with decision making in policy GBB. The board believes that the best interests of the district students should be the principal guiding the adoption of all educational policy. The board further believes that appropriate input from the professional staff is important to the decision making process. The superintendent will ensure that there is a process in place to encourage meaningful professional staff input prior to making recommendations regarding curriculum, instruction, and the school program to the board. The process should be conducted in the spirit of cooperation with a clear focus on student learning as the most important function of the schools, and with the understanding that the staff is collectively responsible for the student's performance. Participation in the decision-making process is accompanied with an expectation of accountability by the professional staff. All proposals for change to the curriculum, instruction, or the district's educational goals should incorporate evaluation procedures linked to student outcomes. The superintendent will ensure that the administration team leads to an effective instructional program with a consistent focus on student learning and outcome. Donna Bailey did not ensure that this policy was followed in the midst of two significant, significant policy issues. The events at the high school that led up to and followed Principal Creech's forced resignation all stem from a toxic culture and climate that our superintendent has created and our BOE has endorsed. Mm -hmm. The high school 83 to 1 no confidence vote for the superintendent, a 75 to 1 vote of no confidence for the superintendent and the BOE, and the 67 percent no confidence vote district wide all highlight their refusal to give our teachers and administrations a voice in the decision-making process of the two flawed initiatives that would have had major impact on student performance and opportunity moving forward. This happened under Donna Billy's leadership. Her actions violate board policy. A document that we received via the FOA request also highlights that Mrs. Bealey seems to be thwarting the voice of her fellow BOE members. On the afternoon of February 15th, the day Superintendent Kuchenberger demanded Principal Creech's resignation, 
Jackie Perry sent an email to the BOE and the superintendent asking the board to compromise on the late start issue. Hillary Durgin responded in the email to the BOE and said that she had wanted to, to compromise all along. There are no other email replies from the board regarding a compromise. However, there was an email that Jody Shea sent only to Donna Bealey and Julie Kuchenberger in attempt to strategize and discourage a compromise. This seems to be a behavior that is counter to how a board is supposed to run. Where is the open and honest communication between all board members of the board and why wasn't a compromise discussed further and why was a request for a compromise by two BOE members ignored? Kristen Nilsson, 23 Morning Street. The compromise for the late start only happened after members of the leadership team demanded it after the recall process started. They bravely stood up and demanded that the back and forth stop. If they did not demand a compromise, I don't believe that it ever would have happened. Unfortunately, it was already too late for Principal Creech. Ironically, the second compromise that the board agreed upon seemingly begrudgingly after the recall started was related to the same issue that Principal Creech's teachers asked the board to compromise on all along. Principal Creech lost his job for the failing late start implementation and the hybrid grading model compromise. Donna Bealey is responsible for a board culture that refused to listen to the voices of the students, the teachers, and citizens, and refused to give an inch until recall was on the table. Another FOA document provide, proves that in the aftermath of Principal Creech's forced resignation, our high school leadership team wrote letters to the board and asked to meet with them regarding their principal's forced resignation as well as their concerns about proficiency-based grading. The board refused to meet with the high school leadership team. This is so representative of the apparent hypocrisy of the board and of the superintendent. The board has the ability and the desire to have meetings with staff members on occasion, which was clarified in an email exchange on February 4th and 5th, 2018. On February 4th, Chairwoman Bealey emailed Principal Creech and asked to meet with him with another board member to discuss their desire to meet with his staff regarding the BOE push for a change of school start time. Principal Creech emailed Superintendent Kuchenberger to ask if she was aware that Donna Bealey wanted to meet directly with the teachers because in his experience, it potentially goes against BOE operating protocol. The superintendent replied that she was aware that Ms. Bailey wanted to meet directly with the teachers and that she supported the meeting. So we wonder why she didn't reach out to Principal Creech first and let him know. This exchange is another example of perceived incompetence by our BOE chair. They're willing to walk a slippery slope and appear to hide behind vague protocols of personnel issues when it suits their agenda. Based on this email exchange, it appears that they are willing to meet with teachers without the superintendent when it suits them, but not when the teachers request it. It is another clear example of our district ignoring the teacher voice, and it helps to explain why two-thirds of our voting union district teachers voted no confidence. Amy McLeod at 26 Arborview Lane. Donna Bealey has not effectively communicated with individuals who have filed complaints against the superintendent. We have been given permission to share that a family of an ongoing multi-year racial bullying issue reached out to the Board of Education to file a complaint alerting them of Mrs. Bealey's serious mismanagement of their case in the district. The superintendent chose not to file necessary state and BOE mandated paperwork, even when asked by the family to do so. It wasn't until the family called the state to report this policy violation and met again with the superintendent to demand it be done, while advising her that the state official was willing to come to town to oversee the filing, that Superintendent Kuchenberger finally filed the paperwork. In short, this paperwork was filed months after the deadline. 
The family to this day has none of the paperwork cited in all of the bullying policies in our district, and the BOE is fully aware of this. Ms. Bealey has also not followed up with the seniors' class officers who emailed the board with their concerns regarding the superintendent's treatment of them during a meeting after the voter registration drive. They were initially told via email that the board would look into it and get back to them, but that has yet to happen. Mrs. Bealey took an oath to serve our schools and its students, but she instead cares more about protecting a failing superintendent than advocating for our students. Donna Bealey seems to be stonewalling and gatekeeping serious complaints that our parents are, are bringing against the superintendent. A tenet of the school board protocol is, members of the Board of Education have authority only when acting as a board. The board will not be bound in any way by any action or statement on the part of any board member, except when such statement or action is in pursuance of specific instructions from the Board of Education. Sound familiar? <laughs> Education, we believe that Donna Bealey has violated this tenant. On February 17th, Superintendent Kuchenberger provided Donna Bealey a public statement to be used by the board related to Principal Creech's resignation. The statement read, we understand this may seem surprising to our community. Please understand that this is a personnel matter and we are unable to discuss it publicly. We work closely with the superintendent and are informed and aware of the situation. Why is the superintendent writing Donna Bealey's public statement that is supposed to be from the voice of the collective board? Why weren't other board members included? Why weren't they contributing to this statement? Shouldn't the entire board have had a say in whatever statement was crafted? It seems perfectly clear that Ms. Bealey failed to vet the board's public statements with the board, and even more egregious, she allowed the superintendent, her employee, to write the media statement for the board. Thank you. Alicia Giftis to Saratoga Lane. Why isn't Ms. Bealey acting upon a very important facet of her board chair responsibilities that requires her to keep in mind that both the board chair and the superintendent should have the opportunity for independent thinking and to bring an individual perspective to school problem or concerns. Ms. Bealey has failed to manage, supervise, or hold the superintendent accountable. She has failed to endorse an investigation of the real reasons behind the superintendent's forced resignation of Mr. Creech, which have nothing to do with ineffective principalships. There are several emails in our possession that demonstrate that Principal Creech was supporting and facilitating the superintendent's implementation of PBE. He was not insubordinate or subversive on, of her mission. Ms. Kuchenberger encouraged lead teachers to reach out to her at any time to discuss PBE. She encouraged communication from teachers when their feedback was positive. There was a problem only after the teachers expressed their concern with the implementation of PBE. Two different emails to Principal Creech from Superintendent Kuchenberger reveal her anger that the teachers were doing exactly what she encouraged them to do, reaching out to her to discuss the implementation of PBE. Her anger towards Principal Creech is misguided. The only thing Principal Creech is guilty of is supporting his teachers, which is what we want in a leader of our schools. Finally, Donna Bealey has been negligent in her statements to the community and the media with unsubstantiated innuendo about student safety and Mr. Creech's performance. Yet, according to a Portland Press Her Herald article on February 28th, William Mishu stated that Superintendent Kuchenberger still refuses to offer specific reasons for her decision re regarding Principal Creech's employment. It is a sad and dangerous day in our community when our valued and committed administrators can be forced to resign for no other reason than a subjective, they are not a good fit. Ms. Bealey has demonstrated that she deferred her chair responsibilities to the superintendent who is her employee. She has failed to manage the superintendent while she has been on a singular mission to employ new policy despite the shrapnel that leaves our children. She has ignored the voices of our teachers. Under, our, under her leadership, the schools are experiencing unprecedented turmoil. Teachers are applying for jobs in other districts. 
students are applying to different schools. The potential deterioration of our school system threatens our home values. Those who have expressed concern have been ignored and dismissed. Almost 3,200 people have signed the petition supporting the recall of Ms. Bealey, yet she has never acknowledged anything that she would have done differently, recognized the value of the community's voice, or taken steps to change. It is time for our community to come together and vote yes on recalling Donna Bealey because she is not fulfilling her responsibilities as school board chair. Renee Richardson, 93 South Point Drive, also room F109, Scarborough High School. I'm the band director and I have been for 30 years. I have worked closely with Donna Bealey and I know that she cares about students and, and what they do in school. I'm sure that all the board members do because they wouldn't be put in the time and effort that they do put in to make things happen pretty basically known that if you don't care about students, you're not involved in school things. There's so many other ways to spend your time. My feeling is that we're missing the opportunity we have to make a good school system great. When we were told that there was no compromise to be had in the school start times. It wasn't until the parents filled Wentworth cafeteria and demanded to, to explain the reasons why it would be necessary for that compromise, that any compromise was even considered. And it was not until weeks after that that any compromise on the grading system was even considered, although the facts and the reasons for the need for a hybrid system were made very clear. There are schools in Cumberland County now who are waiting to see what Scarborough does with their grading system because it is working better <laughs> and it's more informative to students, parents, and colleges than just a straight one to four system. And yes, I am a member of the ILT that sent the letter to ask Superintendent Kuchenberger to meet with us, not to fight with us, just simply to hear us. Because we were told on the opening day of school with, with much hope and much optimism that although we were building the plane while we were flying it, we could do that together and our voices would be heard. I too have a degree in school administration. I can remember one of the first classes explaining to us that in order for your faculty to support and carry out a change, they needed to buy in by being a part of it and by building it. And that's exactly what Principal Creech has encouraged us to do. And yet it was after we requested to share our thoughts and our questions with the superintendent that David Creech was told to resign or that he would not be rehired. I spoke at the first meeting about this issue with a very broken heart asking you all to compromise and work together. And you've been able to do that on two out of three major issues. I find it a failure that we cannot listen to the community and to find a way to also come and meet in the middle in terms of the fact that Scarborough High School does need the principal that's brought us to the point we are at, which is a very strong place. I believe it's possible. I believe you all have the ability to do that, and I still hope you will. Thank you. Liam Summers, uh, Holmes Road, Scarborough. Um, Chairman Donovan, I will be addressing all three as you instructed us to do. Thank you. <clears throat> um, it's obviously very hard at times like these to know what the right thing to do is. I'm certain that the three BOA members subject to this recall action have acted 
in concert with their personal beliefs of what is right for the school and the kids. I don't believe their actions have been in any way intentionally malicious or intentionally divisive. However, we are at a place in this conflict that many can't believe we're actually at. The months of discord within this community speaks volume to the vast disparity in what the BOE and the superintendent believes to be right and what the teachers and the community feels is right. That gulf in understanding must be addressed and the divide in our town around these policies must be acknowledged. As a community, we have an obligation to support our elected leaders, many of whom work for very little or no pay and at great expense to their personal lives in hopes to make the town we all live in a little bit better. It's a noble undertaking that is often taken for granted. However, we also have an obligation to expect accountability for actions and policy decisions that are inconsistent with the will of the people and that are at odds with what is believed to be in the best interest of the town. As I stated, I think the three board members have acted in good faith to be a proponent of the vision of the superintendent. Unfortunately, that vision is not one that is clearly communicated well managed or implemented with thoughtfulness or understanding of the ramifications of those policies. Consequently, change must occur. Regardless of the outcome of this recall, it is clear that business as usual for all of our elected officials must come to an end. And a new era of community dialogue, a willingness to engage, actively engage subject matter experts like teachers, and a willingness to be responsive and accountable in the face of criticism and questions must be the guiding principles for those who seek office. I can only ask those three who are subject to recall if they can honestly say they have done what it takes to be open to dialogue, suggestions, and input from those who are directly impacted by their policies, and also ask if they feel confident that the decisions they have made have benefited the schools and community in the way that they intended. Because regardless of intentions, it's the results that matter. The results of the decisions made by the BOE and the SI superintendent has unfortunately left us with a bitterly divided town and a school system embroiled in chaos. You can't ignore a school staff that <coughs> by a nearly 70% margin states they have no confidence. I can't believe any on the board could be proud of that result. So ultimately it's up to each of you to reflect on just what matters the most to you. Your continued residence on this board or the chance to be part of a solution by stepping aside and finding new ways to serve the community that you clearly care about. These are hard choices, but it's the hardest choices which often reveals the greatest degree of character and can be the most rewarding. As a town, we should all share the goal of a strong school government, strong school system, and a community that, re that acts with decorum, respect, and tolerance. In this capacity, we all have some work to do. And regardless of how things turn out today, and regardless how things turn out in this election, I'm hopeful that the actions from this night forward are the first steps to achieving that goal. We should not allow reckless innuendo around the motives for this recall or the reasons for someone to be terminated or fear of who might step up to fill these posts to con compel us to accept anything less. Thank you. My name is uh, Karam Durda. I live on Six Haystack Circle, and this my comments are for all three board members. Thank you, school. Thank you. I do believe, to my very core, that there is a nobility to public service, especially elected public service. One's desire to extend one's soul, intellect, and time into the public realm, but the soul-focused intent to serve is to do good. To believe in the future results of one's efforts is a calling and is what makes us human. Sometimes it takes a crisis to remind us of the value of the institutions that are the backbone of Scarborough and indeed this country. One built on the temple of nonpartisan civil service, the school board. Being presented with deep indiscriminate challenges forces us all to reflect on what purpose those agencies serve, how they help taxpayers, and ultimately the faces of the people who provide those services. I want to remind our community that our school board, these three members, are your family members, your neighbors, your fellow churchgoers. They sit next to you in the bleachers at a sporting event. They stand behind you in the checkout line at the grocery store. They pay mortgages, rent, and college tuition. They care for their loved ones, just like you. By any measure of a benchmark, 
a benchmark that's not predicated by a desire to sow hate, division, diversion, and disinformation. You are not incompetent. You have upheld the responsibilities of your position, which are construction of policies that forward the progress of our kids because of a vision that you have formulated that we have for the growth of our kids. The implementation of actions that respect and enable the profession of teachers, albeit perhaps not perfect all the time. Adherence to a legal process and governance of our taxpayer dollars, which may not be again perfect all the time. You're not perfect. You have made mistakes. You have. And you're now called on to defend your service, which is in question because of a disagreement over your set of decisions. That is not incompetence. You're not incompetent. You've shown the humility and patience to listen, compromise, and enact a late start that's not satisfactory to most. You have clarified that the hybrid proficiency-based approach that was already in place, the one that satisfies a legally required state mandate, accomplishes and addresses to great measure the concerns of parents. You have maintained process and confidentiality in an employee-related matter. That is not incompetence. You're not incompetent. I will never, ever waver my commitment and support for you. But let us not use these chain of events to derail what is good in us. Let us use these chain of events to update charter, process, and ability to be at the same velocity as events and not seek inadvertent refuge in the bureaucracies and inefficiencies of city government. Let us dismiss some of the hubris that we're all I know you will show us transparency and how you will manage better. Communicate ably and celebrate your accomplishments loudly with all of us. Stand tall in this recall and fight for your position. You have my support. I will vote against the recall because it's born out of a lynch mob mentality, two of which have survived in my personal life. Hmm. I will vote against it because it's void of thought and planning for our kids for the future. I will vote against a recall that completely negates all of our abilities to improve and be better professionals and human beings. I will vote against hate and division. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Andrea Byron, 3 Homer Sands Drive. Um, I'm speaking for all three members as well. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I'd just like to point out that each of you have served for years, and all of the um, discussions of incompetence have come within the last three months, which doesn't really make sense to me. If you were incompetent, I think there would be a long history of that, and that doesn't seem to be the case. I also think that every decision that's been made has had years of research, community involvement, and committee, and people don't like the decisions, but that doesn't mean that you are incompetent. I think every conversation around Principal Creech and his resignation is purely conjecture because he chose not to release his records or have a hearing, which he was entitled to. So I feel that the emotion around that doesn't reflect on you or your competence. And there's no clear evidence of incompetence, so it's very hard to fight against that charge. So I hope that you guys continue because there's nothing to prove other than the lack of incompetence. So thank you. Good evening. I'm Lisa Douglas, 531 Dysphasis, Scarborough resident and Scarborough primary school teacher. Um, the fact that I'm here, a lot of people are saying, ooh, you're not really sticking your neck out. I'm here because the same thing I teach my students, and that if you don't stand for what you believe in, you're going to get pushed around. You're going to stand for nothing. Win, lose, or draw, you need to weigh things out, check them out, research them, recheck again and stand up for what you believe in. That is what these three school board members have done day after day after day. You haven't been in my school and watched them come in to say, what do you think about this idea? How would this impact you? You haven't been there. You haven't seen them come in when things, new changes and different things are happening and they want to see what happens. How is it working? And stop and release me from my classroom, have another staff member cover me so that they can sit down one-on-one -on -one and say, 
Lisa, what do you think of this? That is not incompetence. I might not like something that the school board decides to do. I might not like something that happens in my workplace. I'm not the boss. I've put trust in the place where I chose to work, the people that I chose to work under, and I put trust in the people that I chose to vote into position to do due diligence and do the research, make the best judgments. And if something happened that I felt overall maybe this wasn't the best of ideas, that's what our Constitution grants me, the right to vote them out next time. I don't throw mud, I don't throw lies, I don't throw trash, I don't degrade people. Neither should any of you. To call these people incompetent is pathetic. And Jackie, thank you very much. I too was gonna first read the definition of Marion Webster's definition of competence, which is why my phone's here. You wanna argue with Marion Webster? I don't. <laughs> And the teacher in me is rallying, going, wait, wait, wrong word usage. <laughs> so, Jackie, I thank you. But the reality is, is that if there are complaints, issues, deal with it with voting. Don't tear our, phone, our town down. You're tearing our kids apart. Because we're not functioning at our best. And when I say we, I'm talking about you and me because we've got all this other stuff going on. So I ask you, if we have upsets, what's the kid first way to deal with it? That's why you became a parent, that's why I became a teacher, that's why she became a superintendent, that's why they became board members, that's why these folks became council members. It's people first. It's not what I want, it's not what you want. If it means some Uncomfortableness, if it means some inconvenience, welcome to life. What's best for kids? That's why we're here. If someone can stand up and say, such and such truly isn't best for kids, and you back it for me, I'm behind you 110%. I'm not seeing it. Bring it to me. I'm right at Blue Point School. I'm right there for you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm Art DeMauro. Uh, I live at 337 Pleasant Hill Road in Scarborough. And uh, I, I came here, like everyone, I think, to hear opinion regarding uh, the basis for the recall. And I frankly didn't expect that it would be quite so emotionally troubling. This is a train wreck of a, of a process of dem democratic uh, uh, and political activity. Um, deeply, deeply disturbing. In any event, if we're here to hear opinion about uh, the basis for the recall, which is repeatedly stated to be a question of competence, I haven't heard anything that suggests a question of competence. More significantly, I never heard anything about a question of competence prior to the incident sometime around the 1st of March, when the, when the very complex issues of performance-based education <coughs> and start times hit the table. Well, alongside the incident with Mr. Creech, unfortunate circumstance there, no question about it. But, but you know, uh, in the absence of that uh, ability to define the reason that we're here, uh, and I heard Mr. Johnson offer up his, his claim, and I, I just find that uh, convoluted logic, but nevertheless, that's all right, that's his. Uh, we are in a position now to make a significant difference in the course of events for the public schools and for the lives of these people. They don't deserve this in any way. I think some of us have some appreciation for the complexity and the demands of the work of school department, of the school board. I, I, I was on nine, I spent nine years on school committees in Massachusetts where politics is a blood sport, and, and we never had anything like this. 
uh, <coughs> but uh, and we had some extremely heated issues. They got worked out because people persisted in having a conversation, not publicly uh, castigating them and calling them before a meeting and humiliating them, which is what this exercise is. I learned a couple of things. I learned that um, <clears throat> no matter how strong your opinion or how well developed it is, there will be opposition. That's a good thing. That's okay. We need to have that in our discourse. Um, I also learned that uh, in, in the course of, of those, uh, those many difficult and complicated conversations, uh, that it, it, wasn't, it wasn't a bad thing when superintendents and school committee members communicated effectively, got along, and, and cooperated. That was considered to be a good thing. It is cast as a bad thing. It's cast here by the leadership as a measure of incompetence because they agreed and they supported each other. And I find that astonishing. I was prepared to get a little bit into the Mr. Creech situation, but I appreciate that that's not what we're here for. <clears throat> Except they do want to offer one comment. Someone came close to this notion that there's, there's a fly in the ointment here that we don't know about. What could it possibly be? If it's rank insubordination, that's serious business. It's not a crime, but it is serious business to be a member of a team. That, and I'm guessing, I don't have any inside dope on this, I'm guessing that he, he represented a different point of view than his team on the issues, the com very complex issues of start times. And <clears throat> could you wrap up, please? I'm sorry. Could you wrap up, dude? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. I didn't realize it was going that long. I will wrap it up. I will wrap it up. Uh, I just want to comment. In terms of the, the, the quality of our schools, which I think has something to do with, um, with our leadership, uh, we know that the U.S. News and World Report found us exemplary. Many of us know we're exemplary. Someone mentioned that, that real estate values are threatened because of the conflict in the school system. Well, talk to any of the realtors in town about uh, demand for real estate and, and prices, which is a driver. The schools, excuse me, schools and the quality of schools is a driver of, uh, of, of, the, uh, of the quality of the schools. So uh, we, we have a rather convoluted and, and distorted argument here, and I sincerely hope it will be defeated. There are strong arguments for a sooner meeting, uh, 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 election, and a later. Thank you. Uh, I wouldn't uh, presume to know which one is best. Thank you. Good evening. I'm uh, Jim Elkins, 8 Raven Terrace. Um, I think it's already been talked about what the recall process is about. And I think this is a clear abuse of that process uh, because, as others have said, I, I see no incompetence. Um, I think instead we should be congratulating uh, our school board members. And I, I speak to all three of them, but I also want to talk a little bit about Donna Bealey's leadership. I think under her leadership, uh, she mentioned some of the things that she accomplished. But I wanted to mention five things that I think have been really important uh, first of all, I'm a member of the School Business Partnership Committee. And this is the first time under Donna's leadership that there's been a real link to the business community in this town. We've asked for it, now we've finally gotten it. I think that's very important. Um, secondly, through countless hours of discussion, contrary to what other people have said, um, they've persevered to implement a school start time calendar that's moving us towards best practices. It's not all the way, but, it, but it's getting there. Very important. Thirdly, they've worked uh, uh, tirelessly uh, towards uh, implementing proficiency-based high school graduation requirements. Now, these aren't just our own ideas. These are mandated by the state. It has to be done, and, they, and they've conformed. Um, they've worked to develop a district budget process which is very fair and transparent, a lot different than when I first arrived here in Scarborough 20 years ago. I think they should be congratulated for that. And lastly, uh, in the face of tremendous controversy 
They've been steadfast in adhering to district personnel policy and main state personnel law means to maintain the confidentiality of sensitive personnel matters. We can't just put everything out on the table that happens, uh, and that should be understood. So in summary, I think dealing uh, with these and a lot of other matters that Donna has shown really positive leadership and that we should congratulate her and the rest of, their, of uh, the board members for their professionalism. Thank you. Thank you. I am Mary Starr, uh, Six Haystack Circle. Uh, I'd like to talk about my fellow board member, Donna Beely. Uh, however, first I'd like to tell you about my experiences with Donna prior to joining the board or a little over about a year, year and a half ago. Um, Donna's been on the board close to six years, and I've followed the school budget fights during those years as a concerned parent. I can tell you during all those years, I always felt grateful that Donna and others on the board at the time were looking out for my children and for all the students in Scarborough. I never worried that she was a one-issue board member that only cared about her own priorities, as is common on many boards. She worked collaboratively with the board and the superintendent to support the education of our students. As a board member for the past year or so, I've worked with Donna on the policy committee, and she was again competent. When she was policy chair, she was prepared and knowledgeable. On the negotiations team, she brings her years of experience and education to the table and works to provide a competitive salary for our staff while still remaining a responsible steward of our resources, again, competent. As board chair, she works tirelessly to manage all the competing responsibilities of the position, hours and hours of work. Communication on the board is challenging due to the infrequency of, meetings, of the meetings of the whole board, but Donna will regularly call to each board member separately to keep us informed. Her concern and care for the students in Scarborough drives her to continue as a board member even under these difficult circumstances. It has been extremely difficult to see people accuse her of incompetence. It is hurtful and an extreme reaction to a disagreement. Donna works collaboratively, collaboratively with me on the board, but we don't always agree, but that does not make her incompetent. I support Donna Beely and know her competence firsthand and her experience and her commitment and compassion are strongly needed on this board. Thank you. Leanne Giambalvo, 59 Jasper Street, Scarborough. I am here as a taxpayer. I don't have a child in the school. I don't um, serve on the school board or I don't teach. But um, I voted for the people that are on the school board and I support them. And if I had a concern with something that was happening, I would take it to them directly and expect to be um, listened to, but I wouldn't necessarily expect them to behave in the way that I wanted them to behave. I would expect them to do what's right through their um, activities and their uh, requirements. I am also concerned as a taxpayer that recalls are expensive, and reestablishing new people in the school board is also expensive. And um, personally, I would rather see people present a new person to run for school board, and we vote people in, we vote them out. We don't recall them. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Brent Crossman, 10 Barley Lane. Uh, I'd had written down a few things about uh, that I had been aware of about Donna's background, but she had said, and I don't want to repeat it, but I would wish that we could repeat it 100 times because it's a very impressive background and we're very lucky to have her. Um, I did want to touch on a few things that had been raised. Um, uh, one is, our, is the quantification of incompetence. Um, I think there's a few minor points to be made on that. The first one is that, and I think it, it's minor, but but a third of teachers chose not to vote in that no confidence vote. And I, and I think that there has to at least been some suspicion as, as to why that might be. Uh, when Justin Sebens wrote a letter to refute claims that had been made um, by Road to Renewal, claims specifically that the superintendent didn't incorporate teachers in the decision making, he was lambasted for that and forced to resign. I think that 
might start to highlight why teachers would choose to avoid this situation and not vote. When you take into account the third of those teachers that chose not to, um, I believe the 67% starts looking like a um, more divided, uh, divided um, message. And in particular, the more important part of that is the second part of that, because you'll hear that raised a lot, the 67% or the no confidence, but the more important part of that is what it is, it was not saying, you know, that there should be a recall or there should be incompetence. And I'll read what it said. It says, we asked the administration to join the leadership of this association to co-construct a well-articulated plan to map out how staff voices will be ensured and all the decisions made uh, that directly impact the classroom and our profession. Now, I, I wasn't sure whether that was before or after the superintendent did that on the hybrid grading, but those statements that came out from it seemed to be exactly what the SEA was calling for, and I would think the board would be doing their job to just suggest that those processes should continue, not that we should just rip apart a board that's been so strong for the town, supporting the budget, and, um, and, and undo those things. I want to talk about one other thing that you hear a lot, which is the, um, the you know, refusal to listen on the, comp on the start times conference. This was very important to me because I cared a lot about the conference. I thought it was, it was important to do. There was, as had been said when the person raised it, there was a lot of science and evidence behind it. Um, and, and they said that if they just compromised on that and compromised on PBE, and someone mentioned this online too, and it was a little bit funny because we're like, wait, you know, those did happen. They did compromise on those things. So, so then there's this twist. It wasn't, it wasn't early enough. So they didn't abandon evidence-based policy fast enough for you, and they didn't, um, they didn't, you know, the current plan causes, uh, I think according to the American Academy of Pediatrics, 87% of high school students wouldn't be getting the recommended amount of sleep, so they didn't make them suffer in that way fast enough. I mean, I think there's a point where the, the, the amount of effort it should take to overturn strong evidence-based policy should be a lot, and having board members strategizing about how to keep evidence-based policy doesn't seem like a, um, uh, like incompetence to me. It seems like what I would want of my board members. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Deb Bunce from Port 4 Partridge Lane. I had three different things to say. I'm trying to combine them, so hopefully I'm not all over the map <clears throat> so that we can just do one of these, right? Um, I want to start by saying that I'm deeply saddened and disappointed that because of their disagreements with the superintendent, some members of this town have chosen to attempt to recall these three incredibly hardworking and dedicated board members. What a shame. There are much more <coughs> respectful, dignified, and effective ways to solve problems than to target innocent people. The public elected all three board members, and there's a planned term cycle that allows for stability and experience on the board. We will lose this incredible experience and knowledge by recalling these three board members. If the recalls go through, then in November, five out of seven board members will be new, and the two remaining only have one year experience. That concerns me, worries me about where we're headed. How will the board, at that point, be able to do their jobs competently? How will they know how to do their jobs? Donna Bealey, Jody Shea, and Carrie Lyford have competently led the school board and have fought hard to to put forth a budget each year that provides students and teachers adequate resources and opportunities. They were able to create, as Donna said, um, a budget that allowed for one-to-one -one student computing and return sports to our seventh graders. Additionally, they've worked hard to engage our state legislators to encourage reasonable and fair school fi financing at the state level, even though this has been a challenge. They've helped craft and support numerous policies that have benefited our students and staff. These have included increased late starts for the high school staff when they ask for more time away from their students to prep for PBE and accreditation. A number of parents were against that plan. They didn't want their kids out of school more than they already were out of school. But the members of the Board of Education, Dr. Kuchenberger, all listened to Principal Creech's request and believed it was in the students' best interest to hear the concerns of the teachers and find a way for them to better prepare for those challenges. These additional late starts are put into place for last year's school calendar, a year prior to the well-publicized, well-researched, and well-planned change to the school start times. 
It bothers me when I hear people say, this is, this, nobody let us talk about this. Nobody brought this to public attention. Nobody had a chance to, to say what they wanted to say about the school start times. I was a member of the committee two years ago talking about school start times and trying to decide. And that I did because I saw something in the Scarborough Leader that invited people to come be a part of that committee if they wanted to be. And I thought, I want to be on that committee. I'm a school, I'm a psychologist. And I know it's good for kids, adolescents, teenagers, middle schoolers to go to school later. It's been that way for over, we've known that for 10, 20 years, a long time. It just takes us a while to put this into practice. So I was one of the people who was happy to have that change and then kept thinking this is going to blow over. These are just some people who are against it. They haven't been paying attention. We all filled out, anybody was asked to fill out a survey to say what you wanted. There's been meetings to help people solve their problems around this. I kept thinking it was going to blow over. And then, then before I know it, we're going to recall three of our Board of Education members I sent an email and said, I didn't know that I have to stand up and jump up and down and scream and yell to let people know that there are people out there who want this to happen. I was glad that we were trying to stand firm in a decision that was made before Dr. Kupkenberger came into this role. Um, Please be mindful of the red. What's the red? Oh, it says 54 seconds. It's you've gone over 54 Oh, sorry. It's because I combined everything. I only have one more statement to make, and I'm, I'll be done. This is new. I'm new to this. Um, uh, these board members have shown their competence by being willing to support changes to the schools when they are in the best interest of students, even when there are some people who do not agree with them. I just want to thank all three of you for sticking with your jobs, sticking with this work. And I appreciate you and support you. Thank you. Speakers, please be mindful of the uh, the red light. The signals, time's up. <laughs> I have to say it before I get up. Right? Um, I'll try not to take that personally. Um, my name is Alec Mimberduke. Um I live in Old Millbrook, um, and I'm here today in support of the three wonderful, wonderful people who sit before me. Um, and I do not believe they are incompetent. Um, if anything, I think uh, perhaps they are too confident. Uh, they were too, they've been too focused on uh, doing what is right for children and not always doing what is politically popular. And that is an incredible character trait uh, to have and one that is really, really hard to have um, as an elected official and one that is hard to have uh, in an environment like this. And so I have huge respect, I think, for uh, the initiatives that you, you fought for that have been unpopular and the ones that nobody ever talked about. Some of the things that have been discussed earlier today and I'm sure not that many people showed up for the meetings for. And I was at some of the meetings, at least here, when we were voting on the funding for those. And I can tell you, there was not that many people showing up for them. Um, you know, uh, and I think Donna talked about them nicely. One-to-one -one computers, uh, profession supporting professional development, the backpack program, pre-K, uh, fighting to make sure that we're holding uh, all of our elected leaders accountable to make sure that the state is actually providing the funding that this town deserves for our schools so that we don't have to have the brouhaha's over every single school budget. Um, uh, fighting for the school budgets themselves. I know it's been talked about a lot, but I think a lot of people in this town take that for granted, you know, quite frankly. Uh, it takes a lot to put a school budget together. It takes a lot to get a school budget passed. And I know I've been out there knocking on doors. I've been out there making phone calls. I've been out there um, uh, donating and, uh, you know, uh, helping to make signs, but not a lot of people have, you know, it's been, it's been a hard fight to get enough people together to pass school budgets, and it's great to see a lot of new faces in this room, and I really hope every single face in this room will come out to support the, um, uh, school budgets in every way possible so we can pass a school budget on the first vote this time. I guess I would also like to say that, um, you know, uh, incompetent compared to who? Who are these folks running against? You know, I think to me that's like the scariest part of all this. You know, I've heard uh, a lot of different interests being represented by the folks uh, who collected signatures to recall these three wonderful people. Um, some of them are upset about, quite frankly, what the state has done for proficiency-based education at the state level. I get that. I totally get that. It's a big, complicated policy that was massively bungled, in my opinion, from uh, the LePage administration to the Department of Education to the legislature for not providing adequate resources so towns could do it effectively. Um, other folks who are angry about school, school start times, not a super popular policy apparently, but I can tell you it would have been a big 
help when I was a teenager. I probably would have done a lot better in school if, if that had uh, a later school start been in effect. And then I guess uh, lastly, because I got my red um, <laughs> showing up here, um, you know, uh, incompetent compared to who? Like who is going to be putting in the amount of time? Who cares that much to take this much heat and then still stand before us today? Um, uh, because they care for it for basically no money, right, uh, associated with their positions. Uh, not much prestige, almost no fanfare. Um, and, uh, yeah, that will continue to fight for kids. I would love to know who those people are, and I'd like for them to come forward so I can know who I'm judging these people against. Because if there's better people out there, come forward. Come forward and announce yourselves. I'd love to meet you and have a conversation so I can know whether or not, whether or not you're actually going to be better than me. Thank Otherwise, you. <laughs> My name is Sarah Crossman. I'm at Tangarly <clears throat> Lane in Scarborough. Um, my remarks apply to all the members, uh, so I'll only make my appearance one time. Um, we've all been talking about the notion of incompetence. Um, I think it speaks volumes to me that we heard from a leader of the group behind the recall that as recently as two days ago when asked about what quantifies competence or incompetence for that matter and answer didn't, didn't come about. That speaks volumes to me because for how long has this process been underway, right? For how long have we been talking about these board members being incompetent without there being an actual reason behind it? We've now heard that that's defined by a no competence vote in the high school which I agree is powerful, it's a powerful statement. But I also temper that, that judgment with the understanding that this vote took place after the petition process was underway. So for that, that for, to me reads as a retrospective attempt to defend an action that's not justifiable. Incompetent is a really charged, loaded term, and I think that most of us would agree that when we're using it to describe someone, it's used in terms of speaking to one or more of the following, their efficacy, their intelligence, their dedication, their capabilities. So here we are under the guise of defending the competence of these board members when if we were honest with ourselves and each other, we'd acknowledge that the complaints against them have nothing to do with their competence but are rooted in deep-seated and strong opposition to some of the decisions that have been made. But let's face it, a petition to recall would not have moved forward with a stated rationale of, I disagree with them. As you consider how you may vote on this issue, I urge you to look at whether anyone has been able to demonstrate true incompetence on the part of any of these board members or on the part of the superintendent, or whether, whether what you've seen are arguments about decisions that have been made. There is practically no decision that they could, they could decide um, that we could all unilaterally unanimously vote in, in favor of. And what that tells me is that literally every decision that they're faced with will have a pocket of citizens in Scarborough that is in disagreement. That opposition doesn't make the decision wrong, nor does it make the decision incompetent, nor does it make the people who've made the decision incompetent. We've had too much speculation about things that we do not, cannot, should not know. We've heard it tonight. We've heard it in comments like, there have been no moments of self-reflection. That speculation. So. What I want to just wrap this up with, because I think that we're starting to hear from a lot of people that know Donna, Jody, and Carrie directly, what they've brought to us. What I can see and what I've observed is that they care deeply about our schools and have brought about some real and significant achievements, um, which include, for me, the search and recruitment process that brought us Dr. Kuchenberger and one of Maine's first transgender student policies. To deem them incompetent would be to totally disregard those achievements as well as the values, credentials, experience, intelligence, and dedication of these individuals. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Hello, my name is Alan Cornwall. I live at 21 Hinton Creek Drive here in Scarborough. And I wasn't fortunate enough to be here at the beginning of the meeting because I had a prior obligation, but here I am. So I missed people's definition of incompetence, but I did look it up while I was here, and I want to go over it again. Inability to do something successfully, ineptitude. So if we, if we really talk about that, it's not about a personal opinion. It's not how we feel. It's doing what their responsibilities are. And those responsibilities come from the Maine School Management Association. They're clearly defined. 
<clears throat> there's rules and responsibilities as board of directors. And whether you're the board of directors for a business or you rule the board of directors for a nonprofit or the board of education, your responsibilities are to provide oversight and regulation for the for the senior executives of that organization. I work for a company that has an external board of directors and they challenge us on a regular basis. They don't make our lives easy. They get us out of our comfort zone and they make our business better for doing such. So when I look at the main school management association um, requirements, one of the things we have here is recruiting of recruiting, hiring and evaluating the performance of designated chief executor, in this case the superintendent. So we were fortunate enough to hire someone who was least qual less qualified than other candidates that had presented themselves. Uh, we pay uh, one of the top salaries for that person in a state where um, they're one of the less, less experienced superintendents. I don't know if you've ever been to a Board of Education meeting, but I was fortunate enough to have my lovely wife decide that you should attend some of these. Before this became a hot topic in the town, I went to some of the meetings, and I was infuriated when I saw groupthink. There's no diversity in this group. Everyone thinks alike. Some of the things were presented from a financial perspective had no thought process, just like, we need to do this, we need to do this, we need creativity. Let, uh, the superintendent should be overseen by the Board of Education, not the other way around. And a lot of the communications, you can see the superintendent is leading the direction of the Board of Education in competence. When I hear communications from the, the Board of Education, they talk about, we're restricted in what we can say. We have to think alike, and that isn't really true. They have to have a shared vision. It is true. You can shake your head all you want. You're one of the problems. So well, you please, must have please, a please. shared. You must have a shared well, vision. Kind of order, yes. Line, please, 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 please do not please. direct your comments in uh, that they're, manner. They're directing them at me. They're, I missed that part, but they're shaking their head at me, so I'm re I'm refuting that. Anyway, so the Board of Education must have an established shared vision. That's different than all having the same opinion. That's different than going out. As a matter of fact, the, the, the requirements say communication with var various constituencies is absolutely vital to the success of a board member. Quote, unquote, to be an effective board member, you will want to maintain open communication with stu schools, staff, students, and members of the community. The communications should be formal and informal. It's responsible the, re of the Board of Education for remaining this communication. The board's ultimately accountable for all the results of these actions. I've heard concerns about who will run. Uh, this is the beauty of the de democratic process. You don't know who will run. I hope we'll get some more diverse representatives in our population. I hope we get some elder people in the community. I'd love to see more interaction with some of our, our great elder communities in town and they can share that experience and knowledge with our students and vice versa, bring some vitality to those people in those communities. <clears throat> the re recall process is not hateful. As a matter of fact, I will say, I've been to many meetings, no one's ever said anything personal about any of these people. A lot of people have said very nice things about these people. Um, Please be mindful of the red. Yeah. Am I over? Yes. I'm, I'm colorblind. Yeah. All right. I'll, I'll close in saying recall is part of the democratic process. It's not hate. 19 states plus the District of Columbia permit the recall process at the state level while it's often done at the local level. In addition, uh, Virginia has the same process. So it isn't hate, and it isn't something that's not part of a democratic process. Thank you. Thank you. I think the uh, lady uh, there is next. I didn't know there was a line behind me. I'm sorry. It's okay. I'll get in line. Thank you. I wasn't going to speak tonight. Um, Could you I'm sorry, my name is Betsy Gleistein. I'm from 14 Long Meadow Road. Thank and you. I wasn't going to speak tonight, but for like so many others, this is, this is very personal to me. My daughter showed up this year in eighth grade as a hardworking, good student. We soon found out that there were no more grades in the middle school and no more honor roll. The new grading standards were not well understood and were demotivating. I asked my daughter, how do you get a four? She said, I don't know, you can't get a four. Another time I asked, are you gonna do some additional work on your project? She was a very hard worker on projects. No, she said, it's good enough to get a got it. This low bar for standards actually became a joke in my house. Did you unload the dishwasher? 
no, I did everything but the silverware. It's good enough to get a got it. In another case, I asked, are you going to study for this test? No, I can just take it again. And there were other problems with the grading system related to people who are introverts and people who work and think in different ways that I won't discuss tonight, but I'm very happy to discuss on a one-on-one -on -one basis or with anyone. And so a motivated student who strove for excellence was demotivated. As a parent with no notice or information, I was not prepared to deal with the grading changes and feel they were poorly implemented. And so I consider that the system failed my student. I've heard from some other middle school parents, they feel the same way. I'm very worried about the effect in high school, even though we're talking about hybrid grading. We've been asked to speak to incompetence about these BOE members tonight. This is extremely difficult for me. You are very hardworking volunteers. I really appreciate your service and I respect you all. I truly do, but I ask, who do I hold accountable for this if not the BOE and the SI? That is the point I've come to about this and the other issues raised here tonight. Who is accountable? And I have to say, I believe it's the BOE and the SI, and I believe that's why we're here tonight. Thank you. I'm Brian Shumway from Five Memory Land. <clears throat> so a petition has been circulated and certified to recall these three women sitting at the table from the Board of Education. The official stated reason for this recall is their incompetence. Anybody who's had followed the work of the Board of Education, listen tonight and watch their commitment, diligence, effort, and contributions to the Board of Education and to the betterment of our school department and to the community in general would know that none of them are incompetent. Incompetence is a hurtful charge. In fact, I'm not quite sure that people know what it means or even that it means what you think it means when you say incompetence. It actually means that they lack skill. They lack ability. It means they're unable to do something successfully. I challenge these charges and ask every voter in Scarborough to consider whether these women's actions truly merit these horrible allegations. Each of them is focused. They put countless hours into reading, learning, and inquiring into what the best practices are in K-12 education and applying them to our school district. Each of them is collaborative and team-oriented. They work well with their fellow board members to build consensus and move policy forward. We have a former educator, we have two former educators, who both know the difference between an abstract theory and a practice that will have an impact on students in the classroom. They are not incompetent, and nobody who decides to vote on May 8th should vote to remove them from their posts as members of the Board of Education. This recall effort is not about incompetence, though. As most know, it started as a reaction to frustrations with a start time proposal that was conceived well before this current board began serving. That start time proposal ended up, ended up being modified to reflect community and educator concerns. It's no longer an issue. The effort continued based on a set of misunderstandings about the use of PBE. I'm gonna skip a little bit here, but the punchline is it's no longer an issue either. The chief driver of the effort now is a pair of HR related grievances that frankly, we have no business getting involved in. Our system allows for community and staff involvement in the selection of principals and system superintendents. We don't allow that same involvement in employment related matters related to these two positions. These three women being recalled should not be used as pawns to oust our superintendent, nor should they be used as pawns to get a contract reinstated for our first time high school principal. It's simply not right. Our BOE will lose three people in November, regardless of the outcome of this recall. Consider that for a moment. Mary Starr, Jackie Perry, and Donna all sit in seats that expire this year. Each of these women is a member of our community. Even after the recall vote, they'll be our neighbors. Think about that, and think about whether you'll be able to look them in the face if you make this unprecedented move to recall them from their office. 
all based on a dubious charge of incompetence. Thank you. My name is Mike Doyle. I live on Shady Lane in Falmouth. Sometimes uh, not having somebody with a dog in the fight uh, can help uh, everyone to focus for a moment on what is before you. Uh, the, the textbook definition of, of incompetent or competency uh, has driven the discussion here quite a bit. Uh, I have substantial management experience in a very large organization for many, many years. And uh, I've put three kids through school systems here in Greater Poland, two in South Poland, one in Falmouth. Uh, the competency issue should be fully explained by the fact that 3,000 people decided to sign the petitions to have a recall election. When you get that many people in one town to sign a petition, there is obviously a major problem that has to be addressed. And this is what's causing this meeting tonight. And I think all the discussion, both pro and con, are all very meaningful. But the election will decide whether this was a substantial problem that had to be addressed and these people had to be recalled. And I think that's, that's the bottom line of this entire situation. You can defend yourself, you can be attacked, and so on and so forth, but the election will make the decision for everybody in this town. Thank you. Hi, my name is Stacy Newman. I live at 17 Windsor Pines Drive. I want to speak about all the board members, um, although I know Jody Shea the best. She is my neighbor. Um, there's many reasons why I'm going to be voting against this recall. The first is that none of these women are incompetent. When I first moved to Scarborough in 2009, Jody Shea told me everything that I could know about the schools, the budget. I think many of you know. Um, how important the schools and the budget are to me and how much information I try to get. That information comes largely from these three board women as well as the other board members. I came here tonight to try to help answer questions for some people in the community who've asked me, Stacy, can you help me ex explain the recall to me? As a lawyer, I know it's very important to try to understand all sides, and so I've done that because I haven't been able to answer those questions from my friends. What I'm hearing today is that people disagree on the positions that some of these board members, some of the positions these board members have taken. I've heard many people here just about get up and say they're great, they're wonderful, they're dedicated, they're not incompetent. They don't say that little part because they can't because that's what the recall has to be based on. I just disagree with their decisions. That's not a basis for the recall. One of the previous speakers described this as a train wreck and an abuse of the process and I couldn't agree more. This is a terrible precedent to set in our town. Are we going to recall every elected member because we disagree with the decision they make? I regularly, as these poor town council members know, <laughs> write my council members, the planning board, the board member, to give them my opinion. It might mean that they go ahead even though I, they've done something I disagree with. That doesn't mean they deserve to be recalled, certainly not for incompetence. We're on a slippery slope here, and I think it's very dangerous. We live in a democracy that allows for elections. There will be elections in November. At that point, you will be able to see who else is going to be running for the board. At that point, you can decide, do you think that person is a better fit for this town or not? To do it at the recall now, when you have no idea who is going to step up, if anyone's going to step up. Frankly, I would suspect anybody who would agree to be on the school board at this moment. So I am vehemently against the recall. Jody, Carrie, and Donna, I want to thank you for your service. Anyone else wishing to speak in the first public hearing? Uh, I'd like to read comments. Close the uh, public speaking uh, portion and turn to the assistant town manager who has the written public comment that we solicited. Thank you. I will be reading comments in the order th in which they were received, all time stamped, um, so they will not be read in any order of anything other than the time of day that they were <coughs> received. I will read first comments that were sent to us to apply to all board members, and then I will read comments that were specifically sent to apply to Donna Beely. <clears throat> From Art Dillon, 
To the town council, I wish to add my voice on behalf of myself and family who are unable to attend. We do not feel the recall for incompetence should be happening. While the concerns of many may not have been addressed as quickly as some believe they should, or compromises be met partially or in whole, personal matters not open for public discussion or disclosure, we don't feel these three school board members lack ability to perform the duties they were elected to. While allowed by town charter, we feel the recall is being used for a reason it was not intended in targeting three board members unjustly. It's fine to question and disagree with decisions made. If it inspires people for change, I highly recommend run for office. Put yourself in those positions. While there are only four voices at our home, we do not support this recall and plan to vote accordingly, whichever date is selected. Sincerely, Art Dillon, 180 Black Point Road. From Amanda Morin. My name is Amanda Morin, and I live at 96 Coach Lantern Lane. In regard to the recall and the stated reason of incompetence, my commentary stands for all the board members in question. I've been struggling to come up with examples to show my belief in their competence, and I've realized that because I cannot combat a negative, I have no reason to have ever questioned competence. We all probably know people who have been incompetent at their jobs. Those are people who fail to meet the standards set out by their job expectations, not fail to meet the expectations of all the stakeholders. That is not the case here. I see no evidence of incompetence in the least. I see caring members of the community who are not only competent in meeting the expectations and responsibilities of their jobs as outlined, but also have, who have gone beyond that to also listen to community stakeholders with very differing demands. This is not the definition of incompetence. It is the very definition of competence, and I hope the community of Scarborough will remember that as we inevitably head to the polls. From John Anderson, 5 Owens Way. Good governance is essential to drive any change. It requires strong communication and leadership. In the cases of the recent controversial issues that have come to a head over the past few months within our school community, we clearly have a governance issue. In my opinion, the school board members that we elect are meant to serve as the bridge between the community and the school administration. They play an important governance role. The community and the school board share a common goal of ensuring the best student outcomes for our children. We may not always agree how that should happen, but I believe that they have an elected responsibility to put their personal opinions aside, and when the community voices dissent to the extreme that has been done, even prior to the recall, it should be a fair expectation that our elected officials listen and do as the majority feels is appropriate. We expect them to provide proper oversight and controls with the school administration to ensure the best execution and provide a sounding board to the superintendent to be successful. In the case of the recent change initiatives, I don't believe proper oversight was in place and has led to rocky implementations of PBE and school start times that were issues leading up to this recall. This lack of governance and oversight can't continue. I respect and support the institutions that are in place for the school board to run business, but I do not support hiding behind these institutions to effectively manage stakeholders and to minimize any responsibility they have to the citizens who elected them. Change is a good thing, but change without proper buy-in, support, and appropriate planning is doomed to fail and has resulted in many concerned teachers, students, and parents on the direction our schools are taking. As the chair of the school board, I believe Donna Beely is primarily responsible for the governance and oversight issues that we have experienced today. With Jody Shea as the second in command as the vice chair and member of the communications committee, and Carrie Lyford as the chair of the communications committee, I believe they also share in the responsibility for the lack of effective governance and community stakeholder engagement that has resulted in this public hearing where 3,200 citizens have requested a special election. Because they are in these positions, I feel are most accountable for where we are today, and because there is clearly significant unrest in the community on decisions being made by the board, I believe a recall election is necessary for our engaged electorate to validate whether these are the right people to serve on the board. As a parent, trusting and letting go of children of control over the destiny of your child is one of the hardest things you can do. I believe these board members have the purest intentions, but unfortunately, if you look at the results of the impact on the community, they have lost that trust, and I hope to hear from them tonight how they will earn that trust back. From Jesse Humble, 4 High Point Road. I will hold. Thank you. <coughs> From Julie Krithavis. I hope I have not hurt your name. Jody Shea, Carrie Lyford, and Donna Beely have selflessly given their time, energy, and compassion to this community. Is this how we repay them? Shameful. Who will want to work for the good of our children if this is how they are treated? Just because some may not like decisions made by our board doesn't mean that these members should be recalled simply because it is allowed legally. These three women are not incompetent, and people should not be able to falsely claim that they are just to get their own way. Specific to Donna Beely. Donna Beely has almost 40 years of education and leadership experience. She's honest, clear, balanced, and altruistic. Her choice to speak in the best interest of all her students, past and present, thousands of them, make her worthy only of our utmost respect Claims of incompetence are dumbfounding. 
And that is from, I'm sorry, Colleen Quattararo. Thank you. <laughs> from Kristen Allen, 34 Woodfield Drive. I met Donna Beely during the fall of 2015 when she was campaigning for a repeat term on the school board. Donna has dedicated her life to providing quality education for students. It is a shame that her life's work is being put on public trial because people don't agree with some of our Board of Education's decisions. I support Donna, value her experience and dedication, and attest to her high level of competence in leading our public education system here in Scarborough. From John Cloutier, 9 Wildwood Lane. Donna Beely, I have never met Donna, but it is irresponsible to allege that she is incompetent without providing specific examples and rationale for those allegations. I have seen no action or inaction by Donna that would lead me to believe that she is incompetent. Her long tenure in education and balanced leadership are a testament to her competence. From Colleen Aman, Donna has been in education for almost 40 years. She's been a classroom educator, principal, and board of education member, and is the current chairperson. She is an amazing advocate for Scarborough students, researching current issues, and making decisions with our students in mind. This behavior does not match the definition of incompetence. Thank you. Uh, Mrs. Beely, would you like to make a closing remark? Uh, what's, your, what's your pleasure? We can take a break before you do that, uh, since we're already just beyond two hours. I'm going to go ahead and take a break. That's Good. Uh, we will recess for uh, six or eight minutes. Thank you. Yes.